Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Danielle Crittenden. And today in the co-splaining chair again is Emily Yaffe. Hi, Emily. So good to be back. So great to have you. Now, Emily, as everybody knows, is a contributing writer to The Atlantic, and she's also on the board of advisors of Persuasion.community, which is this new publication organization, which we all love, which is sort of devoted to centr centrist thinking. Is that fair to say, Emily? Um, I, I'd say it's devoted to liberalism, small L, um, open society, the ability to discuss difficult issues without putting your career on the line. Without canceling. Well, this is, this is um, I always like also having you for topics like we're going to discuss today, which can we just say is like about sex, but like sex criminals and sex offenses, because you're always just got a very measured approach. And I, you know, I, I keep forgetting that for many years you did the Dear Prudence advice column for Slate and you got, you must have gotten so many crazy questions about sex. So there's, you're really unflappable on these matters, I think. I learned so much from my readers and things that I thought, oh, surely this is a hoax. Uh, clearly we're not. It was just my na naivete. Well, before we get to today's topics and guests, which is about the sex registry and the injustices of it, and that will make sense when we start explaining it and talking about it. Um, um, I wanted to just talk to you about, so this is the first podcast we've recorded where we do know the results of the election. Um, and we're assuming that Joe Biden is the president elect. And he is the president. Elect. <laughs> that could be a hoax, Emily. We just don't know that yet. Um, but that being said, uh, there he's he's we can now sort of get back to being critical of things on the Democratic side. And one of the, the, the in past episodes when you've been on, we've talked about his contributions to Title IX. Um, and could we see that we saw the Trump administration uh, education, Betsy DeVos, secretary, try and roll, quote unquote, roll some of these things back, um, which we agreed with. So do you want to talk a, a, about a few things we might see that uh, the Biden could do that will not have a great effect on canceling issues? Um, well, let me just say, maybe this discussion is best had after January 20th. Um, <laughs> And we're not quite there with uh, completely being comfortable criticizing them. <laughs> I'm not criticizing I, them. I, um, what you're talking about uh, are the rules that uh, Joe Biden as vice president was the point man on to address uh, sexual assault on campus, a very worthy endeavor uh, undertaken with clearly the best of intentions. But if the Democrats care about systemic unfairness in our society, they really need to start looking at the system that was created on campus to try to stop something bad, something uh, uh, completely unfair and um, un-American was put in place. A system of punishment, investigation and punishment on campus that comes under the rubric Title IX, which is a federal law. It's very simple federal law. Uh, the law prevents discrimination uh, in education. And it is the law that's used uh, to investigate and punish students accused of sexual assault. And unfortunately, what happened was a kind of runaway campaign um, where uh, people, it, it expanded, uh, just expanded beyond reason what would be considered uh, sexual misconduct. Uh, it created kind of kangaroo courts to punish people. There were young men uh, expelled 
uh, from their schools who never received written notice of what they had supposedly done, were uh, not allowed to know the evidence against them, were not allowed to um, speak in their own uh, defense at a hearing, et cetera. And uh, having written about this for many years, um, when Betsy DeVos, Donald Trump's Secretary of Education, decided to take this issue on and reform the reform. Um, I wrote for The Atlantic, what happens when a morally repugnant administration mm -hmm. um, takes on a morally righteous cause? Well, we saw this was one of the very, very few things the Trump administration did where they did it by the book uh, they followed all the rules. Uh, DeVos's, I don't agree with everything in the literally hundreds of pages of new rules that were released. I don't agree with everything she said, but she did bring back essential due process. She brought back basic rights to the accused. Um, she enhanced protections for the accusers and overall uh, put in place a much better system that has just gone into effect uh, over this past summer. Joe Biden has promised to strike it as one of the, his first acts. He's promised right. to abolish right. these new regulations. Right. Well, it'll be interesting to see if he follows through on that. I mean, one of the things that has happened in this past week as we're recording is, um, I know I can talk about this with you, Emily, the Jeffrey Tubin Me technical too. <laughs> the what? <laughs> Me too, Ben. <laughs> uh, for listeners who do not know about this, Jeffrey Tubin, a longtime contributor, a very prominent star like contributor to um, The New Yorker and CNN, uh, was caught masturbating on a corporate Zoom call. And he has now just been fired. Um, and and Emily, you and I were together socially after he this had been found out and we were all we were talking about it and what sort of should happen to someone like this. Um, and, and then I made the point that I thought there was way less outcry uh, surrounding this incident than there had been in similar or even lesser incidents in the past. It was almost like the Me Too movement was more subdued about it or it has Black Lives Matter and all the other problems we've been facing has, has uh, sort of surpassed the outrage that was, you know, would be predictably follow this. And in fact, he even had some quite prominent defenders in the media saying he should not be, he should not be fired. And this was just unfortunate. And he didn't know he was on camera, blah, blah, blah. What do you think? Well, the specifics of it, as we understand, were he, the New Yorker was in a big uh, kind of office wide meeting to discuss their election coverage. And uh, they they went to various breakout rooms and I guess he broke out. The, yeah. <laughs> so he apparently had two computers, one, the New Yorker and the other one during the breakout session, um, he got on a phone. A porn set. cam. Yes, a porn cam. Well, it was it, apparently it was a live sex thing. It was interactive. Whoa. Yeah. Um, and he thought, as a 60-year-old person might, oh, I've Is turned off technology? my Zoom on this one, and I'm just Zooming on this one, but he hadn't. Uh, so his colleagues got to see the end of uh, his masturbation. The end of it. You mean the culminating yeah. moment, as it were? Well, the yes. Climactic moment, one might say. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> so, Come on, so, I, I, you're, I'm the prudish one, Emily. You're not supposed to be prudish. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm trying to be prudent. <laughs> so um, this, you know, you say, where was the outrage? Even though, you know, as soon as the hashtag me Tubin was created, you yes. thought, oh, my God, this this guy is dead. Um, it he once he was told or this did, did came out what he did. He said this was completely accidental. He 
thought the other screen was off. He never intended for his colleagues to see this. And I absolutely believe, I don't think there's anyone saying, oh no, he did it on purpose no, to no. appall his colleagues. I think everyone accepts and understands this was a horrible mistake. Although if you were Sigmund Freud, you would have a field day with this right. mistake. Right. Um, so he wasn't trying to do something terrible to his colleagues, which is different from me too. But what happened, well, I mean, is yes, you can barely contain yourself. I mean, it, it caused a kind of mass hilarity. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, appalling and comic. It's a, you know, kind of classic tragedy in that the hubristic hero's own flaws bring him right. down. Um, and we were all, everyone was, you know, what is the New Yorker going to do? Yeah. I heard a lot of people saying they thought, oh, you know, he'd been, been writing for them for 30 years. He is a legal superstar there. There are so many issues he covers. They'll just keep him, you know, quiet for a few months and then he'll be back. I, I thought he will not be back because um, he's lost his moral authority. Mm -hmm. He's turned himself into a national joke. Yeah. More than he's not a Harvey Weinstein. Yeah, for sure. Do you think now, that was correct? Here. What? Do you think that was correct that, that he lost his job? In general, I think people should not lose their jobs or careers except for egregious things. This was an accident, kind of, but it was also extremely reckless. Yeah. Um, in its own way, I mean, it, you're right, I was dear prudence. I got a lot of masturbation at work questions. That's so interesting. I bet it's a thing. It's like, I guess it's sort of the, the thrill of being discovered, the danger element of, uh, and the secrecy, I'm doing this and nobody knows, but I mean, I, I, they I, ranged from the guy in the cubicle next to me masturbates after lunch every day, quite vocally. If you walk by, you can see him and I can't get HR to do anything. I swear to God to a young lawyer wrote to me. I got in the office really early one day at 6 a.m. No one was there, but then I saw light on in the managing partner's office. I went over to say hello. He's at his desk masturbating. I mean, you kind of feel sorry for these guy, this guy, like I'm getting to work at 6 a.m. just so I have a little privacy and she, and so her, you know, her question, I walked away immediately, but now I'm afraid. And what do I do? OK, um, I think a good rule is don't masturbate at work. Yeah. No sex at work. Seems pretty simple. But now with Zoom, what's work? I mean, we're both home. We're working. But I think even so, if you are engaged in doing work, Wait till that's done and you close down your laptop and you move on to and, your phone. and don't have those senior moments, you know, like not not knowing fully how to operate your technology. Um, so what do you think? Do you think he should have been? Uh, yeah, I mean, it just seems so unprofessional. Uh, fun fact, um, Susan Glasser, who was on our podcast two episodes ago, uh, she's the uh, White House correspondent uh, for The New Yorker, and she apparently was supposed to have been on that call and wasn't. And she she was so relieved, especially when her colleagues, you have now more details than um, I knew, uh, but she she was like, oh, so relieved. And I'm like, I'm sorry, the journalist in me wanted to be there. Like, oh, my God. I, if I was, you know, like, I knew. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, so, Emily, would you want to just set up the, the, the topic? And, and because this was in Persuasion, this, this arose from an article that was in persuasion.community, if you want to go look it up, uh, on the sex registry. And it goes counter to what anybody who only casually thinks about these things knows. Uh, right. I, we are going to uh, talk to uh, the author of the article, uh, Carol Nestakis. I hope I'm remembering um, that I'm pronouncing her name correctly, who um, is the mother 
of a 33 year old son who is on the sex offender registry. And the title of the story in Persuasion is My Son is No Sex Offender. Um, I was the editor on the story. So uh, Carol and I worked together uh, closely on this. And we'll also be talking to a sociologist, Emily Horowitz, uh, who's an expert in this. I, 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 I guess you'll do a more full introduction, Danielle. But Carol's is a first person account of what it is like uh, to have a loved one on the registry. Her son is intellectually disabled. Um, he can't care for himself. He has kind of the, the intellectual um, ability of a 10 year old, um, but one who, who is very naive and gullible. And Carol will explain how he ended up on the right. registry. And the story really tells how completely out of control this registry is. It is there are almost there are 900,000 people on it, almost a million people on the registry. They are not the worst of the worst. They are not uh, uh, the vast, vast majority are not a danger to society. And um, the point of the story was this whole thing needs to be rolled back. Um, you're not safer because there are all these people on the registry. Right. It, 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 to my mind, it, it's very similar to people who get imprisoned for a first time possession of some sort of recreational drug and then your whole life is ruined. But OK, well, let's bring on. It's Emily Horowitz, the sociologist, as you mentioned, Ed. she's author of Protecting Our Kids, How Sex Offender Laws Are Failing Us. And Carol Nistakis, Nistakis, we'll make sure we're pronouncing that right. Uh, she's also now um, she's become an activist on this, um, and she's one of the co-founders and vice president of Legal Reform for People with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, which is a national nonprofit organization. So let's bring them on. But first, a quick word about a new sponsor I'm very excited to have aboard. As women, we're often concerned about our own safety, especially when we're out at night or alone in our homes. And as someone who is not comfortable carrying a gun, not least because I'm worried it will more likely be used against me rather than help me, I've wished there was a better method for safe self-defense. Well, there is. Taser's line of non-lethal self-protection devices are small and lightweight enough to carry with you or in your glove compartment or purse or even put on your nightstand yet they're powerful enough to incapacitate an attacker. Guns, as we know, carry unnecessary risks for you and those around you. And even pepper spray can harm you as much as an attacker, and it's often ineffective. Taser products are safer and easy to use. They use an electrical charge to immobilize attackers for up to 30 seconds, allowing you time to escape and send emergency dispatch to your GPS location. Taser devices come loaded with features like laser-assisted targeting and emergency dispatch, which will send response teams to your GPS location upon firing. So you don't even have to figure out where your phone is or call 911. More than 237 lives have been saved with the Taser network of devices, apps, and personnel. Protect yourself and your family with Taser's line of smart self-defense products. Taser is available without a permit in most U.S. states. And get the Taser Pulse Plus or a Taser Strike Light at Taser, that's T-A-S-E-R, dot com with promo code FEMSPLAIN. Save 15% now at Taser.com, promo code FEMSPLAINERS. That's spelled T-A-S-E-R dot com, promo code FEMSPLAINERS. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Welcome, Emily number two and Carol to the program. <laughs> We've got two Emilys on this, so we're going to have to be 
careful that we know who's talking, but welcome. You call me old Emily. No, that doesn't sound very Emily H and Emily Y. Just I, I'm one of the oldest Emilies. Emily the elder. We could <laughs> Emily the younger. Um, anyway, welcome. So Carol, tell us why don't you just set up to well, set up, tell us what happened to your son and how he got on the sex registry. Okay. Uh, I am a parent of a 33-year-old young man uh, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. He functions about the age of a 10-year-old. And um, he is on the registry. Uh, In 2012, he was uh, arrested and prosecuted and uh, convicted. Uh, he uh, does not know what the registry is. He has been on the registry now for eight years and he's regressing. Uh, I decided that I needed to fight this and do something to make a change. So I'm also the co-founder of Legal Reform for People with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities in the Criminal Justice System. So uh We work hard at that, and I'm also working hard to try and help our family get through this nightmare that we're in right now. Well, how did he get on it? Like, what did he do? Okay, he, in our neighborhood where we lived in, uh, there was a young man who lived next door. He was a foster, and they later adopted him at age 18, but he had come from a very dysfunctional family. How old were they both at the time? Uh, at the time that he moved in, he was 10 and my son was 14. Okay. So we kind of took this young man under our wing. He had um, a very terrible childhood and we had him in our house quite a bit. And we went camping and we took him out to dinner and he was at family gatherings. So we had a very good relationship with him. But as he got older, he got he obviously got very confused. And when the boys were in their 20s, he started to uh, sexually molest my son. And he was also molesting uh, his niece that lived in the household with them. So- uh, And this was not your son, this was the other young man, as it were. Yes. Uh, so uh, the, um, the young girl told the adults in the house and uh, they had come over and said, you know, we're going to take our son to the police station. And they did. uh, When they questioned the uh, young girl, she mentioned my son's name. And six weeks later, they came and arrested him. And we spent the next year in court trying to save our son from this, but we were not able to. We ended up having to take a plea because they had 19 felony convictions on him. And uh, we did take a plea uh, down to one misdemeanor charge because otherwise they said we would go to trial with these 19 felonies. Uh, Literally what my son did was he was manipulated into exposing himself to the young girl in the house. Um, and this was, a, a, and not to minimize this, but he he is a mentally impaired young man who, through this kind of circumstance, exposed himself. He didn't do anything more than expose himself, I assume. Right. How did they come up with 19 charges out of this? Uh, well, from what I understand, being that I wasn't very, I was very naive at the time and didn't know anything about the criminal justice system, they do come up with all kinds of charges in the hopes that something will stick. So uh, I was reading. Let me, just, let, me just, uh, let me just add, um, I know from having written about the criminal justice system, it's very common for prosecutors to vastly overcharge, gives them enormous leverage, they don't want to go to trial, they want to force people into plea bargains. So we will drop you know, 18 of the charges, you know, and, and get you on a misdemeanor or something. They just um, want the conviction. And also, Carol, I think you should uh, clarify um, that the neighbor boy told your son, you know, to expose himself, that it would be fun, as you told me, uh, it would be a fun thing to do. And your son had absolutely no understanding 
of what this was. He didn't touch the girl. And as you said to me, he had never been in trouble before and has never been in trouble since. So anyway, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Oh, that's okay. That's that's absolutely true. Yes. Uh, they, um, he said it would be funny if he exposed himself. And so that is what happened. And, uh, but like you said, we did plead down to that one misdemeanor charge uh, because we were threatened that he would go to prison or be institutionalized. And either choice is a death sentence for him. He has so many disabilities. Um, I had said we are his caretakers forever until I'm gone. And then um, his sister will take over. You know, he needs to be reminded to shower, to, to eat, to, you know, brush his teeth to do, you know, do all those kind of things. He's never going to date anyone or get married or be on his own. So uh, we had no choice. We had to take that plea in order to save it, literally save his life. And there was no leniency, leniency granted to, to either of them, but especially your son. This is a one off incident. He is mentally impaired. What did the judges say? What did the prosecutor say when you said they, they, they didn't recognize any of that? Well, we basically gave them to all the documentation. We have so much documentation, I could fill a file cabinet with it. Um, we gave them all the documentation while we were in court. They never talked to us. They never talked to him. Everything went through the attorneys. Our attorneys were not very educated in anything like this at all. Uh, this was new to them. Someone with uh, his amount of disabilities being charged like this. So they were just pretty much thankful that it came down to this one misdemeanor plea. And we were told that, you know, we should be grateful for that. And even though my son did not understand any of it, he uh, had to agree and the, the way he did it was the attorney stood next to him and whispered in his ear uh, as he stood before the judge and told him when he had to say, you know, yes, your honor, when he understood, because they said if he didn't say he understood, he would go to trial. And what is the upshot now for him? I mean, first of all, I, I, as I understand from the story, you, you lost all your sort of savings that you had, in fact, saved for when for his care, you know, when you can no longer care for him. Um, and he had been part of the Special Olympics. He'd been scuba diving. Um, he had a whole very healthy and productive life given his situation. And is that all gone? That is all gone. Yes, he was uh, pretty happy and fulfilled. And uh, he was a contributing member of society as best he could be. And now it's, it is all gone. He has nothing anymore. He just basically uh, stays in the house. Um, he has one disabled friend and uh, all those peers that he used to socialize with, they're, they're all gone now because he can no longer participate in any, any of those activities. So no, he doesn't have a life anymore. This is um, probably, uh, well, the whole family did get destroyed from this. So, you know, for him, he's regressing because we were told that his brain was still developing at, you know, when he was in his 20s, he was 26 years old. He, it was still developing and he would regress and he is regressing because of this now. You've all heard the expression, why buy the cow when they're giving the milk away for free? Well, that applies to podcasting economics as well. Unless we put up a paywall, which we don't want to do, we very much rely on the support of our subscribers to keep the Femsplainers going. If you enjoy the podcast and haven't yet subscribed to Patreon, you're essentially getting a free glass of milk every week. Actually, maybe in our case, it's more like a, a lovely full-bodied glass of wine or a spicy cocktail. But don't get us wrong. We greatly appreciate all our listeners, and certainly it helps drive our advertising. 
but even a donation as a little as $1 per month would be a huge help. That's less than the price of a glass of milk. And in return, you'll receive our monthly exclusive podcast, Last Call, in which our subscribers get to ask our guests questions. You'll also receive our newsletter. And if you pledge $10 a month or more, it's really just the price of a happy hour cocktail, you'll get an ad-free version of the podcast every week. And, well, <laughs> if you commit to the cow for a year, you'll get 10% off your annual subscription. Wait, did I just call myself a cow? In any case, we need your support. Please go to patreon.com slash femsplainers and pledge whatever you can. And I'll stop with this cow milk analogy. Let me bring in Emily Horowitz to thank you, Carol, for um, I'm just actually genu genuinely speechless. <laughs> um, Emily uh, has written a fantastic book on how the sex offender registry came about and has gone wrong and has gone wrong in the way Carol just described a harmless young man who never who committed a yes what he did was wrong he didn't understand it it was a minor offense and the entire family's life is ruined um emily can you tell us kind of summarize your book how we got here with this sex offender registry there hasn't always been one so how did we get a sex offender registry and how did it grow so out of control well we never in the united states the first Public registry uh, was passed in Washington state in 1990. By 1996, there were public registries in all 50 states. And the registry emerged because of a few highly publicized, stranger, horrific murders of children. Um, in some of the cases, uh, the murders were not done by people who had been convicted of a sex offense, but um, there was so much hysteria around these murders that, um, they resulted in calls for new legislation. Jacob Wetterling, who you mentioned um, in the amazing article in Persuasion um, about Carol's son, um, her son was uh, abducted and murdered. And after that happened, Jacob Wetterling's mother wanted a list of people who'd been convicted of sex offenses as a tool to help police officers. She didn't envision it as a public list. Um, this was before the internet and technology that criminal justice had access to was more limited. So it came from a good place, um, but it eventually and very quickly got totally out of control. Um, a lot of the uh, crime, a lot of the registry laws are named after kids like Jacob Wetterling, who, um, in fact, the person who ultimately was found to have killed Jacob Wetterling had never been convicted of a sex offense. So the registry is only helpful um, if somebody already has a sex offense conviction. So there's almost a million people on this public registry. And I think um, the registry is, is, is a post-conviction, post-punishment, um, public shaming tool, but it receives massive support because there's so much hysteria and panic around crimes involving sex. I would say, like you mentioned, that the prosecutor threw dozens of charges at you. And so it almost seemed like you were getting off by pleading to one misdemeanor. Um, but that's commonly done in all cases, and it's a way to force people to plea. But I think probably uh, Danielle asked, why didn't the judge consider his uh, emotional disability at the sentencing? And Quite frankly, we see in case after case, I've been studying this and talking to people on the registry for 10 years at least, um, judges don't consider any extenuating circumstances when it comes to crimes involving sex. So even though there's been all this work for criminal justice reform in recent years, if the crime involves sex, it's, it's thrown out the door. Even Salt Lake in Florida, uh, they passed a, a law that allows those with convictions to vote, except not those with sex crimes or murders or sex offenses or murders. Well, let's take a step back because I think one of the reasons uh, people don't understand what's going on is because when we, a layman, which is such most of us are on this, when we think of the sexual uh, the sexual regist sex registry, we think, well, that's a 
that's a good thing that surely most of these people, they've been convicted of sexual assault or rape. And I, I, you know, if he's in my neighborhood, I I don't, I, you know, it's good to be able to know that. Um, So really, but so how common is uh, this incident involving Carol's son? Like how, what percentage are, of, of the registry are, are, are just people who are co- convicted on very minor things or on trumped up things or on crimes that they would never commit again. Like there's no danger that they would do again. Well, I can, I, I co-edited a book with uh, Larry Dubin, who I'm sure Carol knows, who's a law professor, whose son um, was convicted of a sex offense. And the book is all about people with intellectual disabilities who've been con- convicted of sex offenses. It's impossible to determine the prevalence, but we have, we talk to lawyers uh, in many states and many families like Carol's, and it appears to be uh, a significant problem that people with intellectual disabilities are convicted of sex offenses. Um, Unfortunately, those in like the autism community are not willing to advocate for this population. We also know that 95% 95% of sex offenses are convicted by people who are not on the registry by first time offenders. So the registry doesn't protect anyone. Almost all offenses are committed, like even if in, in Carol's case, it was a non-stranger situation. Almost no sex offenses are commit, can, uh, committed by strangers, stranger abductions, things like that. I mean, the registry is only helpful if um, um, you want to protect your children from strangers. It doesn't help uh, if it's coaches, if it's teachers, if it's family members. And we have 40 years of research showing that almost all sex offenses involving children are non-stranger offenses. Well, one of the um, disturbing cases there, with this, uh, Carol, is directed by your article to an, another article by Human Rights Watch. And I'm just going to read you this case because it's also affecting minors as well who are um, caught up and in this case, this this is a, uh, about a boy, Jacob C., who was 11 years old, living in Michigan when he was tried in juvenile court for touching without penetrating his sister's genitals. Found guilty of one count of criminal sexual conduct, Jacob was placed on Michigan sex offender registry and prevented by re- residency restriction laws from living near other children. I'm just going to go on just a little bit more because it's it's such a remarkable example. This posed a problem for his family. Jacob's parents were separated. His father lived in Florida and Jacob could not live in the same house as his little sister. As a result, he was placed in a juvenile home. And when Jacob was 14 and still unable to return home, he became the foster child of a pastor and his wife who, who helped him. But then when he turned 18 during his senior year in high school, his he had been his status as a sex offender, which had been private, became public and parents of his schoolmates tried to get him expelled. Uh, he had to fight to walk across the stage at graduation. He tried going to college and then dropped out again. And eventually he moved to Florida where he got married. He had a child. They divorced. He could not get any custody of his child, all because of an incident with his sister at 11. Now, we don't know the full details. That's all I know about the incident. But could this apply to, you know, the old little kid game of playing doctor or show me yours and I'll show you mine? Like it just this this young man's life has been destroyed. And it's clear that doing something at 11 does not mean that's something you're going to do at 25 or 18 even. So tell us a little bit about that. Uh, Emily H. <laughs> yeah, I think you, that's from a Human Rights Watch report yeah. that was all about minors on the registry. Right. Some states allow m- minors to be on the public registry. Others, they get on the registry when they're adults. So yeah, there, you can be convicted of a sex offense when you're as young as nine in some states, um, which is completely nonsensical. Many people on the registry uh, are convicted of Romeo and Juliet offenses where the uh, one partner is under 18 and the other is above 18. And even if they're in love, there's cases where people get married, like a 19 year old uh, has sleeps with, has sex with a 16 year old. Um, they're put on the registry for statutory rape and they get married and they have kids and the person is on the registry for life. Um, 
And there's many cases like that. Um, and there's, also sexting yeah. cases. Sexting. Yes, teenager. for both of them. As so, teenagers? Yeah. Pardon me? As teenagers? I thought that's all teenagers. Yes, yes, yes. Sexting, you're, you know, if you're an adult, you can send a nude photo of yourself. Yeah. If you're a teenager, you do, there apparently. are literally teenagers on the registry for uh, engaging in child pornography by sending a classmate a nude picture of themselves. Um, did the, once you dig in to how absurd these laws are, you don't get to almost a million people on a sex offender registry because you are putting the worst of the worst and people who anyone would agree um, have committed heinous crimes and are potentially dangerous. You get there by doing what we did with the war on drugs and the war on crime. And as Emily H was saying, the sex offender laws were passed in the mid nineties when we were on a steroidal binge of criminalizing things. So we, in many cases, criminalize normal teenage behavior and you can be on for life. And Carol can tell us more about how miserable life is once you have a loved one on the registry. Yeah, tell us, Carol, maybe set up first the, the, just the legal repercussions, like what, what you're told. Okay, so your son can't live near a school, et cetera. And then the personal repercussions to your family and what happened. Well, there, there are so many rules and restrictions that even the normal lay person, well, even, even uh, law enforcement uh, can't figure them out half the time. A lot of times they uh, have rules that they've, they thought they're supposed to enforce, but they're not really rules. I have members in my organization who have been told to move when they had to get an attorney and they really didn't have to, but the uh, the officer said, you have to move because you live too close to a forest preserve or so on. So there's so many rules. But because that's a parkland that kids might go in or something. Right. Like mm -hmm. they can't go. I think there was, uh, maybe it was in your article, there was like one, um, uh, so somebody tried to move near a drainage dis ditch, but because children might play in that drainage ditch, they weren't allowed to be there. So, so, so there are restrictions on where you can live. Right. Um, and you have to check in how often with, well, uh, we check in yearly now that, uh, my son's no longer on probation. I take him, he wouldn't know when to go and then he would be in violation and end up in prison. So I have to make sure that I take him and uh, I make sure that I go in with him because he has to uh, put his initials and sign things that he doesn't know what he's signing. So I have to make sure that I'm there all the time. Um, you know, we have our rules and restrictions about parks and schools. We did have to, uh, eventually we sold our family home that we lived in for 35 years because he had to move out and my husband had to move out with him because he can't he can't live by himself. So um, because we use so much retirement money and money for his future, we couldn't possibly keep our house and um, the condominium that they moved into. And then I was going back and forth to my daughter because she had lost a child. So I was. Um, trying to go back and forth. It, it's, it just got to be too much uh, money-wise financially for us. So we did sell our family home. So when I am at with them, with my husband and my son, it's just a small one bedroom uh, condominium. I sleep on an airbed in a closet <laughs> and my husband sleeps on the couch. And we've been doing that for, you know, well, I sold my house a few years ago, but my son, my husband's been sleeping on the couch for eight years. I mean, we've had to give up everything. Our dream was to move actually to Florida because at some point my daughter will take care of my son. So I need to transfer his services over to Florida. So the dream was to move to Florida and be with family and get him set up here with Special Olympics and scuba diving and a job and that, but that's all gone now because I can't take him out of the state. And that's not to say that I can't take him out of the state. 
But if I do take him to Florida, they'll put him on the registry forever. For life, yeah. They'll never take him off. So I can't, I cannot, that'll eventually have to happen when my husband and I are gone, but I can't do that to him now. I just can't. I'm just hoping for some kind of change before I go, so. Carol, can I just ask you something? One of the most moving parts of the article, because I shared that article with a lot of people I know, and they were all uh, really horrified by the Special Olympics and how your son can no longer participate. Can you just share yeah. that just because? He was uh, extremely active in it, you know, until there were a lot of young boys in the neighborhood and he had a lot of little friends until about the age of 10 when they realized my son is different and they start moving on in life, you know, and maturing. So we got involved in Special Olympics and he just excelled. He has a um, all kinds of gold medals and trophies and things because he participated in just about everything he could. And then when Dive Heart uh, came around and they have a special uh, scuba diving for people with disabilities and for veterans that have come back disabled, he got into that and he excelled in that also to the point where he could help to teach the other disabled children you know, how to get started with it. So he loved it. He just loved it. And um, also there was special recreation and that was supervised activities with his disabled peers where they take them to the movies or they take them to dinner or they'd have little parties for them so he could socialize because all that is very important for his brain development to be stimulated and socialized. And, and it helps him to mature a little bit to learn how to be out and about in, in the community. So he was very active in that. He had a small part-time job cleaning tables and he was happy. And and that just all disappeared. So- Lots of his register. Because especially, yeah. Mm -hmm. Emily H, you've been, Emily Horowitz, you've been, um, as you said, you've been writing about this for a long time. Um, how frustrating is it? Like, where do you see, do you see any change? Do you see any interest in change? Or do people just, you say sex offender registry and their ears close? I mean, it's, it's, it's radioactive. I had, I, I think, um, and maybe Emily Afi can comment on this, but I think the last six months, things have gotten a lot worse. There's been a lot more hysteria about child sex trafficking and, uh, uh, more panic about children and sex. I don't know if it's because people are on social media a lot more, but things like Wayfair and Pizzagate and QAnon um, bring up a lot of these same tropes of children being randomly um, abducted off the street. And it, it doesn't help the movement for sex offense registry reform. Um, well, that's I true. teach in every single, yeah, sorry. No, no, I was going to say that one of the weirdest uh, issues of this, of our political time is these conspiracy theories revolving mm -hmm. around pedophilia. They're being put out by QAnon. I mean, apparently Joe Biden is up to his eyeballs in it. Um, that's how oh, we got being accused, not, <laughs> yeah. not no, I'm sorry, <laughs> according to these conspiracy theories, if that were not clear, no, Hillary Clinton, this is why Emily and my local pizzeria got shot up in Washington, DC because oh, wow, you guys, yeah. came in looking for the so-called Hillary Clinton pedophile basement. So you're right that even before the 90s, even now, there has been this bizarre politically tied hysteria that there is some incredible amount of secret pedophilia going on. And it's endorsed yes. by elites and international Jews, et cetera, the yes. usual, usual yes. suspects. But then then so how, how, do, how have you dealt with this? I mean, how do you deal with radioactive I mean, I material? I mean, I think um, 
you know, people like Carol and families and advocates. There's a group, for example, called Women Against the Registry. And I think that's an effective way to present it because it's mothers and um, wives of people on the registry. There used to be a group, I thought this was a really good um, name. It's kind of dissolved in Texas called Save Our Sons. And uh, mm. that's because in Texas, there were all these young men who uh, were being arrested for statutory crimes, consensual sexual relationships with teenagers like 19, 20 year old boys and 16, 17 year old girls. Uh, the, the word pedophile, pedophilia, it's a trigger word for many people. The majority of people on the registry wouldn't be, you know, there's there's people on the registry who have adult victims. Many of the, the pe victims of people on the registry are above 13, right? So it's not, this idea of a very young child and a much older person. Right. In terms of advocacy though, I think the path forward is for family members. People on the registry right now are, are so stigmatized. And um, I saw there was like a, at, at one of the stop the steal, like recount rallies for Trump, there was a truck and it said, you know, um, you can call me a racist because I vote for Trump, but I'm gonna call you a pedophile because you vote for Biden. Right. And there was all these likes and it was like, you know, high five so it's pretty there's there's kill a pedophile t-shirts that are allowed to be sold on the internet because yeah i think we've been uh in a rolling moral sexual panic for decades i mean you, you go back um to the uh 80s and 90s the the satanic ritual abuse mm -hmm prosecutions of the, this was really a Salem witch trial level uh, accusations that people who ran daycare centers were engaging in uh, just unbelievable, you know, ch human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, absolute insanity. But the grip these kind of ideas have in a way, QAnon has a lot of crazy stuff in it. And one is this the Democrats that run international pedophile rings. But at the time of the satanic ritual abuse, the FBI was investigating, uh, highly educated prosecutors were prosecuting, the psychological associations uh, of America believed this crazy stuff. And we never really, it stopped because it became clear it wasn't happening, but we just, I think part of the danger for people accused of sex crimes is we're kind of recognizing the drug war was out of control and we, we over criminalize, but we always need a demon. So it is very easy to demonize people for sex crimes. But as you say, Emily, I mean, you know, you can look at these studies. It, California has about 100,000 people on the sex offender registry. They had one of the harshest laws in the country. It, they recently passed a reform that's going, going to go into effect in 2021. Everyone on their registry used to be on for life. And now there will be an opportunity after a certain number of years to apply to get off. Um, people, one of the articles I read said about 90% of the people on it should be eligible for that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it just tells you we're not protecting people because these people are in the registry. I think one point we haven't made, and it really goes to Carol's story, people think, well, at least it's keeping me and my family safer. Mm -hmm. The registry is not. The registry takes, are there some dangerous people on it? Yes, but as Emily Horowitz's book explains, they are a very tiny minority of the people on it. It takes people like Carol's son, who were productive citizens, makes them into pariahs, costs a lot of money to monitor them for no good reason. And there, maybe Emily, you could speak to some of the myths about recidivism, mm -hmm. um, about people on the registry. I mean, there's so many, as I was working on the story with Carol, uh, it's really stunning what the public and even politicians believe about people on the registry and what the facts show? Yeah, I mean, um, we know that um, the best way 
if somebody's convicted of any type of crime, including a sex offense, is to, and they're re released from prison, is to help them get a job, help them get housing. That is the biggest predictor of not reoffending. When you put somebody on a registry and you make them um, follow all sorts of draconian rules and you publicly shame them and you don't let them live anywhere, you promote homelessness and reoffense. In California, uh, the residency restrictions just put a bunch of people, um, uh, lost a lot of people who had sex offense convictions. Parole couldn't find them because they didn't have homes. They were homeless. Um, so the whole premise of, of the registry is terrible. We also, we have all kinds of probation and parole and supervision for people. The registry is after you finish all of that. There is no evidence, there's no criminological evidence, there's no data whatsoever that shows that the registry stops any crime or stops any, um, or, or promotes um, public safety at all. As Emily Yaffe said, it, 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 it is a false sense of security. It's only a form of retribution. It's, it doesn't do anything. I also wanted to add, like I said, the first public registry was in 1990 in Washington state, but the first registry was in California and it was for gay men who are arrested for having public sex. So wow. it has like a long, ugly history of, of policing stigmatized populations. And one of the, the most surprising things to me in working with Carol on the story was um, there's a widespread belief that almost everyone on the registry is a recidivist, uh, predator, uh, multiple convictions. As Emily H has said, almost the, overwhelmingly people on the registry are there for a first time offense, but study after study that has followed, um, that's looked at recidivism has found that people who uh, have been imprisoned for a sex crime have the lowest recidivism rate of almost anyone. It generally is less than 5%, which I think most people would be shocked to hear. That's good news, but no one knows this. Right, well, I think right. also, you, you know, we have this sense that a lot is made is when a, a violent rapist is released you know, because of some lax loophole and then they go out and they commit this crime again. But as you point out, Emily, these are not the people we're talking about. Uh, both Emily's pointed out too, that if you do commit a crime, there is a process, you do go to jail. There is a thing called parole. What is shocking to me is just all of these mental health issues that we've criminalized or that we deal with through legal means. So. We've talked about this on the divorce courts. Uh, we've t um, we've seen this with sending, you know, with so many issues with police when you send them in to try deal with difficult domestic matters. You know, they're police. They, they, they these people don't need police officers. They need mental health professionals. Carol, can you talk a little bit about your activism and especially the mental health aspects of this? Like, what should we be doing instead? I, let me just add, Carol, your group had an incredible victory in Virginia. So describe what your group got yeah. passed in Virginia. Yeah. Our group in, in Virginia, we've got some members in Virginia that have been very successful in getting some bills passed there. Uh, one of them, their first one was in regard to uh, a special sex and health education bill that is specifically geared toward the disabled because when our kids go to school they they just fit them in with everyone else mm -hmm. so this bill starts from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade in their ieps for the disabled to teach them with special personnel so that they learn uh right and wrong and you know they're their judgment and their impulses so that they learn it in a simple way because they are concrete thinkers. So they need to learn it simply. Uh, the second bill that they uh, got passed was diversion. Diversion would be where the judge has the capacity instead of incarcerating uh, a disabled person or putting them on the registry, to be able to divert them to maybe special 
special sex therapy, specialized sex therapy though. You can't throw them in with uh, a sex therapy group. I mean, my, that was part of my son's plea. And he met with the, um, with the therapist for about 10 minutes and he came out to me and said, there's no way. There's no way I'm going to put therapist said. right. I am not going to put this this uh, boy in with uh, a group of people where he's going to hear things he's never heard before and learn learn these things. So they need to be diverted into uh, specialized training or or any you know anything else that the judge might divert them to instead of community service, you know, anything that, that they could divert them into aside from being incarcerated or put on the registry for life. So uh, that bill passed. They're working on a second chances bill now that would help those that are already convicted um, maybe have a second chance and get their records expunged so that they can move on with life and their families can can move on. So those are the things they're working on. Of course, training is huge for um, all the way from law enforcement, all the way through the court system into the prisons, because we have some of our members who had their children in prison with autism and uh Felters and other disabilities, and it's it's just been a nightmare for them. Just just a nightmare. So uh, our group's been very successful. We're nationwide now. Uh, we also have some ties to the UK and Canada. Uh, I myself, ha I am uh, an appointee to the Illinois Governor's Task Force for People with Disabilities in the Criminal Justice System. And we are meeting, albeit by Zoom, but we are trying to kind of piggyback on what Virginia's done. And hopefully I am on there as a parent and part of uh, LRID, legal reform for people. But uh, it's important for me to get my story out to the people in the task force and to the public because the story is the heart of it. it it's where you really find out what's going on in the system. Um, you know, we can talk all we want about the, about the registry to the public and it's, it's just a dirty word. And, you know, we, my family wears that scarlet letter now for the rest of our life, unless I can make change. And that's what I'm trying to do. And all my members are trying to do until we can't do it any longer. And we're just trying to get something done to save our children because most of them, uh, if they're not in prison are just sitting at home now with jobs and without a life. It's incredible work that you're doing. I just remind people that the, your group is called uh, legal reform for people with intellectual and development disabilities. Development. Emily Horowitz, any last thoughts on what people can do or how this other reforms that could be pursued? I mean, I think the most important thing is when you hear terms like save the children, save our children, these laws are protecting our children. You have to be very careful um, and very aware and to uh, try to be rational and uh, particularly those, if you're interested in criminal justice reform, um, it's important not to immediately assume those convicted of crimes that involve sex are unworthy. It's very complicated. Um, and they that's it, it's a population that's been um, treated unduly harshly by the criminal justice system for decades as a result of panic and hysteria in irrationality. Wow. Um, your book is Protecting Our Kids, How Sex Offender Laws Are Failing Us. What an incredible discussion. And uh, Carol, I, my heart breaks for you, but what, what, what an what a image of maternal strength and drive yeah. and determination. It's really phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Danielle. All right. Thank you, thank, Emily. Thank you, everyone. People, 
are just going to find these stories so hard to believe. I mean, it, it, it is such a mind bender that these kinds of crimes and these sorts of people are on the sex registry list. Uh, it, it, I don't think people really realize this. People don't know. As I say, we need some, we apparently have some need to have a group of people we totally demonize and turn into monsters. And again, no one advocating for reform of the registry uh, thinks that there's no one who's been convicted, who's a true danger to society. You would hope those people are in prison long enough so that they can't harm people. But you, you know, I, when I moved to my new neighborhood uh, and, and our daughter was in elementary school um, about 15 years ago, at some point I thought, oh, I'll look on the registry to see. I did it. that too. And yes. what did you find? Yeah, because you can do it now on like right. on Google or whatever. Right. So there were, there was no one particularly close and it's hard to, you know, tell what, the people did. And then I was like, forget it. But, you know, in working with Carol, I looked up her son and there he is. And you would immediately say, okay, uh, I'm not going to give that guy a, a job. And he did have a job busing tables and cleaning the restroom at a restaurant. Um, he's harmless. It's just not all right to set up punishments that turn harmless people into pariahs and destroy their lives for no reason. And that, that you know, someone who commits a nonviolent misdemeanor can be on the registry. There's some disconnect there. You know, maybe the registry is a helpful tool for law enforcement or there's a small number of people who might be on it. But, you know, if... As Emily Horowitz said, if you were 18 and had consensual sex with your 15-year-old girlfriend, I'm the mother of a daughter. I wouldn't want my 15-year-old having sex with an 18-year-old. On the other hand, would I want him on the sex offender registry for life if she said, no, I wanted right. to? Right. Well, I, I did that Google once again when my daughter was, my daughters were younger and you're, it's, it's, there were like, I, there, I forget, there were like little green dots on, you know, the map, like where gas station, restaurant, sex offender. Right. And you have, as you say, you have absolutely no knowledge of why those people are there. And it sort of filled me with fear. And I think what the other thing that was going through my mind as they were talking is in this age of conspiracy theory and this now new, uh, paranoia about pedophilia, you can see just like that pizza guy, you can see people going and targeting these households. Oh, know? this happens. Oh, uh, the Danielle vigilante justice oh God. happens to these people a lot. Uh, you move it. it. It's there are states where almost 90% of the housing is off limits for uh, someone on the registry, but um, you know they have their homes targeted, egged. If they have kids, their kids are targeted in school. The Emily Horowitz documents harrowing story. Oh boy. Yeah. Okay, well on that, on that happy, uh, happy note, note um, uh, just a quick heads up to listeners to, um, Next week is our Thanksgiving special, and we're having Peggy Noonan and Leon Wieseltier on for a special episode of Forgiveness and How Do We Heal After This, tra Personal Traumas and National Traumas. So wow. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And Emily, it's such a pleasure as always to have you. Thank you. And um, Thank you. look forward to having you back soon. Great. Thanks, Thanks Danielle. Danielle. Femsplainers is a weekly podcast carried on the Ricochet Network and available pretty much on every podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and watch video of our interviews on YouTube. You'll find links to everything, plus how to contact us directly at femsplainers.com. We survive and depend on your support. Like the show? Consider donating as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash femsplainers. 
and get our exclusive monthly bonus episode, Last Call, in which you get to join the conversation with our guests. And there's much more. And a big shout out of thanks to our audio and video editor, Nat Frum. <laughs>